got a report coming up that uh, is going to be referenced in this next presentation. It's the Canadian Business Women's Network, or Commonwealth Business Women's Network recommendations for boosting women in international trade. You can copy down the tiny URL, or you can take out your smartphone, open the camera, and scan the QR code. That little box will pop open, and then you can tap on that, and then you'll be able to, you'll be taken directly to that report, and you can download and save it yourself. Uh, before we go too far, though, I have about a one-minute video to show you, and, uh, and then I'm going to turn the floor over to our next session's chair. As always, we will be having a question and answer period at the end of this session, so in about an hour's time. And I would ask that if you have any questions, you can either put them into the chat or even better, put them into the Q&A box, which you can find in your Zoom toolbar. That's probably either at the top of your screen or the bottom of your screen, depending on what type of device you're on. So without further ado, I am going to uh, just, I'm getting some feedback here. So I'm just gonna see who maybe needs to go on mute for a couple of minutes while we play this video. There we go, nice and quiet. I just realized I went to all that trouble to make it quiet and there's no sound on this video. Enjoy anyways. And without further ado, I am going to turn it over to the chair of this session. Take it away. Great. Well, thank you very much, um, Janet. And I think um, I think my camera, Janet, could you just uh, um, open that up and then in a pop up there? Lovely. Okay, so that's there, um, and I'm here. So uh, listen, thank you very much, and Ara is the man here. Welcome back. Um, the sun's shining here. Now, Janet, you were calling us the Canadian Business Women's Network. Well, there is actually another CBWN. It's in Calgary, and they're also called CBWN, I think. So there is a link there to Canada. But, um, but we love Calgary. We love Canada. So that's not an issue at all. Yes, yeah, it was I'm, my Freudian slip. slip. No, no, I'm sorry about that. Problem. I'm so used to C standing for Canada. <laughs> Janet, we love Canada. All the Commonwealth loves Canada. So there are friends everywhere for Canada. I think that's absolutely true. Um, so um, let me just begin by saying how delighted I am. I'm um, Ari Zaman, um, the Executive Director of the Commonwealth Business Women's Network. My colleague Frida was on the show in another panel earlier. And we're going to be looking a bit more at this area around trade. There was a, an earlier session today which provided more of a landscape um, of what was happening. There was a follow-up after that looking specifically at the um, impact of technology in the internet value chain over, over the top. Um, 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 technologies and services and now we're going to be looking at this um, really in more in a bit more detail and really to build some awareness because I think there's been a lot going on you could be mistaken for thinking um, that um, you know uh, Brexit and Covid is all that's happened in the last um, you know since the last Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting the last one in fact which was in London in 2018 in April the next the, 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 the next scheduled one was actually going to be today and tomorrow in Rwanda but actually, there, you know, Brexit and um, while Brexit was happening, all the discussions, all of that stuff, as well as the um, 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 pandemic are growing, something else has been going on very important, which is Commonwealth trade. And there have been some initiatives that were started in London. They've been continuing despite the, the challenges around us. And very few people know about them. In fact, I don't, want to imagine, I don't want to embarrass the British government because they, they've been providing some of the support for this, but all the other governments involved as well and other stakeholders, but they're some of the Commonwealth best kept secrets. They are not very well known. I don't know why that is. They're nothing to be embarrassed about, nothing to be shy about. So let's um, all know about these things. And um, they really, there are a number of them, and I'm just going to um, give an, an overview of some of the most critical ones because they really demonstrate the value of the Commonwealth. And sometimes people will say the Commonwealth, does it do anything, does it have an impact, it's just an old fashioned organization. These are all groundbreaking um, you know, initiatives in their own way. 
Um, I should also just remind people, if people aren't aware, that the most groundbreaking agreement on cybersecurity was actually an agreement signed off by 46 heads of government in person when they were in London in 2018. So, you know, the Commonwealth leads the way in that area. Indeed, they're also in another area in terms of the blue ocean economy, the most wide ranging agreement on that was also made um, and with follow up um, plans as well um, at that London Chogham, the heads of government meeting. But what I want to do is to turn to some of these initiatives. And there are three in particular. Um, one is um, Commonwealth Sheet Trade. But I'll say something about that first. And I think what I'll do and I think the way we'll structure this, since we just have the three of us on this panel today, I'm playing a bit of a dual role, both as um, chair, but also as a, as a part panelist. Um, I'll say something briefly about the Commonwealth Sheet Trade, and I'll also combine that with some of the work that we've been doing, the Commonwealth Business Women's Network in that area. Um, then after I do that, then we'll um, hear from Clarice and um, and they say Rwanda again. Well, absolutely Rwanda again. My goodness, you know, they lead the world on on gender equality. We need to be listening more to how they do it, but also we need to be thinking of Rwanda today because we would have been there, many of us, um, in terms of um, celebrating the Commonwealth and um, talking about the things that we need to do better um, if the Commonwealth meetings had gone ahead this week in Rwanda. We look forward to being back there. So Clarice, we'll definitely come to you. We want to hear from you about um, your journey and your experiences as a, as a woman entrepreneur, so an IT entrepreneur, and I know that you're also an UNCAD um, um, E-Trade for Women Advocates as well. So we'll come to that. And after you've spoken, just giving people a bit of a roadmap to what's happening, I will then um, say something about the, the two other key initiatives that the Commonwealth have had since 2018, which I think, again, are you know, best kept secret. One of them is the Commonwealth Standards Network. Um, I'll say something about that more later. And the other is the video, in fact, that you just saw, the Commonwealth Connectivity Agenda. Now, if you were to ask me, Arif, what is the metric of impact for Commonwealth in terms of the last 18 months? There are two or three of them I've just covered in the last two, the last two sentences. One is the Commonwealth Standards Network. You know, that's grown from zero to 43 countries in 18 months, which is extraordinary, but I'll come back to that a bit later. But the other is um, Ministers of Trade. You know, frankly, um, friends, Ministers of Trade are the hardest people in any cabinet to get together at any one time. They're uh, always excuse me, Arif, could you speak a little louder, please? Yep, absolutely. Yep, absolutely. Thank I hope um, my voice is, um, is uh, becoming a bit louder as I'm speaking now, but I'll certainly uh, um, continue in that. Um, Thank you. That's helpful. Thank you, Shafka. So I was just saying that the ministers of trade are amongst the hardest people. Uh, is, that, is that better, Shafka? Uh, yes, yes. Thank you. Okay, my apologies. Thanks for that. Um, I'm, um, I'm um, getting better by the minute. Um, so the um, ministers of trade are the hardest people to get together, let alone get them into the same room at any one time. And in fact, the Commonwealth has done that not once but twice in the last two years. In fact, that's the first time um, the trade ministers of the Commonwealth have come together in 40 years. And they've done it twice in the last two years, the last time being in London um, in uh, October. I was in the room with colleagues from the Commonwealth Businesswomen's Network on both occasions. Um, and I'll be saying something about that and linking that into this Commonwealth Connectivity Agenda a little bit later on. And then after I do that, we'll come to Shafkat, um, who, um, Shafkat, like me, we share a common bond in that Shafkat's from Bangladesh. My father's family are from Bangalore, my mother's family from Lahore. Um, so I'm also uh, of South Asian heritage. I have a bit of a problem, Shafkat, by the way, on my British census form. They want me to say, am I British Pakistani, British Indian? And I prefer to say British South Asian, but they don't give me that option. So <laughs> I, have to, I have to pigeon them over as one of these identities that we have to, 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 to grapple with in today's world. But there we have it. So let me, um, so with, with that's the plan. So I'll say something briefly as I say about um, Commonwealth Sheet Trades and um, the work that we're doing with Business Women's Network and Mr. Clarice. Then I'll come back saying something briefly about the connectivity agenda and the trade ministers meeting, and then we'll go to Shafkat. Now, the reason I'm doing that to, let, to just explain is that Shafkat was with me both in London in February this year, just before lockdown, in fact, and also last August, which is when we first met. But we, there's a very long established relationship between the Commonwealth and the Commonwealth. Um, in fact, for a number of years, I ran a program at the Commonwealth Business Council, which was the only collaboration between the Commonwealth. Business Council and the um, and the South Asian Chamber, and, and it was very effective. So we have a long-established relationship. Um, the Business Women's Network began, in fact, as a program of the Business Council in its origins. But enough of all that. Let me just turn now to Commonwealth she trade. So one of the things we have in the Commonwealth, we have a rarity. 
and I think South Carolina, you, your, your country is one of the few that has um, the benefit of this rarity. But, you know, if I was to say to you, um, you know, New Zealand, Bangladesh, um, um, Barbados, um, you know, and, uh, and, and what do these countries have in common? Um, and it is that they have a woman head of government. Um, there are relatively few of them. There may, yeah, there are probably just a handful of others, but there are relatively few. Um, the UK used to have one, of course, the last um, 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 head of the UK government, the host of the last Commonwealth head of government meeting, Theresa May. And when she addressed the business forum, and I was there in the room, and she addressed, in fact, it was a combined session of the business forum and um, the other fora. Um, she announced an initiative about um, Commonwealth. So, what is Commonwealth? She trade. Um, well, it's a very um, significant initiative. Um, it's really about um, uh, um, um, scaling up and supporting women-owned businesses. It's really trying to understand um, this, this, the, 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 the problem. What's the problem here? Well, the problem is this, that around the world, women still earn less, have fewer assets, bear the burden of unpaid work and care, and are largely concentrated, as we heard earlier today, in vulnerable and low-paying work. And so the UK announced, the UK Prime Minister, um, wasn't Boris Johnson, it was his predecessor, but Boris Johnson, as the current chair in office, has continued this. In fact, he's put more investment into this while he's been um, Prime Minister. So very much a strong commitment, I think, still from the UK. The UK um, is working to, in, in, ro in its role as chair of the, of the Commonwealth, which it occupies until next year when Rwanda will take that on, is increasing women's role in trade, recognizing the importance of trade as a lever for equality. So this initiative was launched in April 2018. Um, it aims to do a number of things. It aims to increase economic growth and job creation in the Commonwealth countries by generating sales worth 28 million pounds. Let me say that again sales worth 28 million pounds through increased participation of women-owned businesses in international trade, number one. Number two, it's providing direct support to two and a half thousand women-owned businesses. Many of them actually are, you know, the kind of businesses that are um, you know, members of, in their own right, individuals of the Commonwealth Business Women's Network. Two and a half a thousand women-owned businesses through intensive training, mentoring and coaching and connecting them to international markets and investment opportunities. Um, and thirdly, it's around developing a tool, a She Trade Outlook tool to help governments access data required to understand the barriers women face to trading equally, uh, freely and equally, promoting better policy making for the benefit of women entrepreneurs across the Commonwealth. Now, this started some time ago. To date, the program has enhanced opportunities for almost 3,000 women-owned businesses to trade internationally by increasing their business expertise in a range of strategic areas, including marketing, branding, packaging, and export strategies through training and coaching. Selected companies are given the opportunity to attend business linkage events, such as international trade fairs, and supported to turn buyer interest into leads and ultimately sales. Um, and the program started in four countries. Um, Shafat, I think you know, because um, Bangladesh is one of those countries. It's also in Ghana and in Kenya, and also in Nigeria. Um, the selection was based on trade potential and flows between Commonwealth countries. We've been hearing about some of that a bit earlier today. Also a critical mass of near export ready women owned businesses, potential for high development impact, and a consideration of uh, geographical spread and existing footprint. Now you may be asking the question, that's all great, but that was phase one. Is that the end of the story? Or is there a phase two? Well, I've got news to tell you there is a phase two, and just a few weeks ago, the UK government announced um, a further development of this program um, to take it um, to take it further. So um, the intention now is to take the program to um, uh, more countries, um, to make it more cross culture, more cross Commonwealth. So during this extension, which is going to run for the, until the next um, Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting and perhaps beyond. The program will continue to support Commonwealth partner governments, and I would strongly encourage anybody from a Commonwealth member government that's watching this right now, they're not one of those countries, they, the first thing they should do is they should go to their member of parliament, they should go to their head of government and say, we want to be part of this. Um, it will help to build the fabric of collectivity in the Commonwealth. So this is, in this phase two, what this is doing, is this, is going to, this will ensure that this tool I refer to, the Outlook tool, and also the associated practices of data collection and transparency are fully embedded and the consequent benefits realized. Now this outlook tool to support women in trade has been already very well received. The, ro the rollout phase was successful. So it's now already um, um, being embedded in use across 25 countries. Um, and you know, there's work going on in that direction. So 
this is very important. I mean, we, there's a long-term vision here, um, which is not just a short-term idea. Um, several million pounds going into this initiative. Um, and it's all about helping governments and the private sector and women businesses themselves to better um, understand the position and role of women in target value chains across different countries, to look at how it's affected women in the value chain as business owners, as employees and as producers and communities more broadly, and also to look at which interventions have had the greatest uh, 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 impact. So I, I won't say more about that, but there is you know, an important initiative. Um, I would simply say on that, I mean, there are some, I mean, you may ask, how's it being um, imp implemented? Again, just some headline points. It's around um, this Commonwealth-wide support, there's capacity building involved, it's working through business support organizations. We're one of those business support organizations. Interestingly, we're the only business support organization that's actually directly recognized by the UK government um, as well. So we certainly want to have a, um, a follow-up conversation with um, Boris Johnson and his team to see how we could um, help him deliver on this. Um, but the other area is looking at, at private sector partners, and, and that's also what they're doing um, as well. Um, so that's the Commonwealth She Trade, and I'd be really interested to learn, Shafkat, from when you speak a bit later, any observations or interactions you've had with them, or what you feel could, more could be done in that area. I can briefly just turn, finally, before I turn to Clarissa, how, how does that link into what we do, the Commonwealth Businessmen's Network? Well, it was very significant, and when, when the Commonwealth um, governments met um, um, uh, in, um, in April 2018, um, they, it was the first time that heads of government anywhere, the UN or any meeting, actually met, came out with a statement that trade was not gender neutral. That is as simple as that. That's what they said. And let me quote you what they said exactly. They said, and I quote from the meeting from the 54 heads of government, and the 46 of them were in London in person in April 2018, um, on a sunny day like today, in fact, they said, under the paragraph inclusive and sustainable economic growth. They, they said, and I quote, to promote inclusive and sustainable economic growth, heads of government resolve to address systemic barriers to women's full and equal participation in the economy by taking a gender responsive approach to the development of trade policy and to promote women's economic empower, um, empowerment. They encourage Commonwealth and partner organizations to work towards an increase in the number and enhancement of the success rate of women-owned businesses break down gender barriers in all sectors and increase opportunities for women to trade internationally, end quote. Now, what they didn't say was how. That is where the Commonwealth Business Women's Network comes in. We're the only organization, as I mentioned earlier, to be recognized directly by 54 governments for our work in this area of women's economic empowerment and women leadership. Um, again, I just want to reiterate for those of you who uh, didn't hear me this morning, I'm the only guy involved. I'm outnumbered Actually, I'm outnumbered everywhere, actually. I'm outnumbered at, um, at, at home, where I've got uh, two daughters and a, and, uh, and a wife. But I'm outnumbered, um, I'm actually outnumbered in the, uh, in the Commonwealth Businessmen's Network everywhere, you know, in terms of the board, uh, the senior management team, the executive management team, the border community. And that's absolutely right, uh, that I am outnumbered. Um, but the, we did a lot of work over quite some time um, um, asking you know, the question of women-owned businesses. We, we 43 countries in face-to-face -face meetings over four years. Out of all of that, we developed uh, a 10-point action plan for increasing opportunities for women to trade internationally. So it's very much the how to meet what heads of government themselves called for. And I'm not going to go through this in detail, but just in headline terms, I'm going to say what the 10 points are. Now, the the link that Janet put up a moment ago actually would enable you to access the full document, which is only about seven or eight pages, but I'm just going to give you the headlines now. The first of them is around strengthening women's voice and agency in trade policy and in regional and multilateral trade negotiations and related fora. That was the reason why I made the point quite strongly this morning about women being in the room. It's frankly not enough to just talk about these issues if we don't have women in the room. I was, uh, to share again the anecdote from this morning, the last business forum, I was in a room of 800 people in the city of London in the business forum. They had a whole panel discussion on technology. There were no women on the panel. There were very few women in, those, in, that, in that group of 800. Frankly, it was a joke. And it was a very bad joke of that. And I, I just think that's not 
that's not um, it's not right. It's not fair. It doesn't even make sense. So we really need to ensure that that changes. So we were instrumental at the last meeting of women's affairs ministers. Um, the Commonwealth Secretary General put forward um, uh, this position around gender mainstreaming, saying that when Commonwealth ministers meet, they should have you know um, gender balanced um, um, delegations. They should have gender items on the agenda. We, the Business Women's Network, were only able to make one direct intervention at the Women's Ministers meeting. We made it very strongly and very boldly. We said, with respect, ministers, it's not just about you, the politician. It's not just about you. It's about all of us. It's about when you convene meetings where you're working and you're speaking to the business community, such as the Business Forum or any other meeting for that matter. That meeting also needs to ensure that women are are there and they're heard and they're listened to and we all know hearing and listening are two different things as we you know as we reflect hearing is one thing listening is something else so women's voice and agency in trade policy is important um, and also in regional and multilateral trade negotiations we were very fortunate um, being able to give direct evidence to the house of commons select committee on international trade as part of their report on trade with developing commonwealth countries and we made that point very strongly and that was very well taken um, the second point is around um, aid for trade. A number of countries are benefiting from um, this initiative, which was, was launched by the World Trade Organization about a, a decade ago. Interestingly, not enough is being done to target that aid for trade, um, where it's using development money from donors to target particularly women's economic empowerment, particularly in areas like ICT. So that's the second area. We need to target aid for trade for women's economic empowerment. Point number three we need to look at trade missions. Now, of course, we are living in a COVID world. Trade delegations aren't happening. As a former airline person, worked for British Airways for many years, you know, no international travel for two or three years, which has you know, decimated the travel industry. So trade missions are going to have to be rethought. But it's clearly the case that generally trade missions are very male dominated, and that needs to change. So we've pioneered the shift there with what we call multilateral trade missions where women are in the majority, not men. But we need to think about women-led and gender-balanced trade missions. That's the, that's the third point. The, the fourth point is around capacity building and training, but particularly with the relate to trade. Um, and this is particularly in areas that are growing service sectors. This was talked a bit about earlier by um, Dr. Sabat Ali in one of the earlier sessions today, particularly so that um, we are enhancing their competitiveness and their participation, not just in supply chain at a local level or the regional level, but also the global level. And we talk about supply chains, but increasingly we obviously need to think about the language of value chains because that's the important thing for economies in the Commonwealth, particularly um, in Asia and Africa and the Caribbean, to move up the value chains, to diversify, to reduce their dependency on, on, on um, areas like commodities and also move up into other areas. And also to harness opportunities for born global firms. What do I mean by born global firm? Well, this is a firm that with an internet connection and an idea and someone with a network they can have international customers from day one. It's as simple as that. And we have to think about women-owned businesses in that context as well. Point number five, and this was picked up strongly this morning in the opening session, it's around closing the gender digital divide. So I'm not gonna say more about that because I think Therese can speak very well to that shortly. Um, the sixth area is about gender impact assessments. There was a lot of discussions right now about trade agreements, free trade agreements, you know, this, that, the other. But actually, we need to think about the gender impact of these agreements, not just at afterwards, but before as well, um, and look at the impact. And there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of good ideas, a lot of tools around that, but gender impact assessments um, in trade policy are very important. Number seven, it's about data, my friends. Data, data, data. I remember when Tony Blair became prime minister, um, around that time, uh, he made a very powerful um, speech um, about saying, you know, his priorities were education, education, education. I think in some respects, the Commonwealth priorities on gender has to be data, 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 because what we need is gender disaggregated trade data. We need trade data. It's not enough. You know, if you're a woman owned business and you never win a bid from a local authority, you know, to bid for, for your tenders and you, you, find, you try and find out how many women have ever um, had that experience, and then you find out that they never have a um, never break out the data. So there's no way of telling whether the tender application is from a male-owned business or a female-owned business. That's not going to help in terms of addressing gender equality. So we need to think about gender disaggregated trade data. Number eight, we need to think about access to finance. Now, access to finance is a bit of an old chestnut. I mean, when the Commonwealth Business Women's Network was at the last heads of government meeting in Africa. In, um, in 2007 in Uganda, 
they um, um, they um, highlight the importance of that. And I think that's certainly an area um, that's, um, that was um, talked about strongly there. I'm not sure whether, can you still hear me clearly? Yeah, I think you can, yeah. Um, so, I'll, sorry, can you, you can still hear me, yeah? I'm just uh, checking. We can, it just uh, sometimes your voice drifts off a little bit, Arif, and uh, you also speak very quickly. So anybody who is maybe listening in their second or third language, um, maybe for their benefit, if you could just speak up a little bit and slow it down just a tick. Absolutely, Janet, thank you so much for that caution, and, um, and I will do exactly that. So my apologies, I'm trying to steamroller this through, but maybe I should not do the steamroller, do the, do the, um, do the slow walk rather than the fast trot. So let me do that. So going back to what I was just saying a moment ago, I mean, basically the, um, the um, work around um, this was um, in terms of the importance of access to finance. We talked about it in 2007. That's still an issue. Banks are still a challenge, can be a challenge, but we need to think about not just existing sources of finance, but emerging areas such as um, crowdfunding, such as um, digital currencies, such as Islamic finance, you know, many Muslim countries in the Commonwealth and many Muslim minority populations as well. So we need to think about that, not just for women to start their businesses, but also to grow their businesses and to grow from small to medium to larger businesses. Point number nine, and I touched upon it a bit earlier, is the P word, and I'm talking about procurement. So prioritizing and leveraging government and private procurement to use diverse suppliers to enhance um, so that women-owned businesses um, can secure more contracts. Now, if I was to ask you what percentage of contracts are won by women-owned businesses, whether you're in Canada or whether you're in Calcutta, whether you're in Montego Bay or whether you're in Multan, the same percentage comes up and it's less than 1%. Let me say that again, less than 1% of women-owned businesses win contracts for tenders from, the, from government or the private sector. And, and we made this point on the floor of the United Nations three and a half years ago, that statistic hasn't changed in 70 years. Makes no sense, makes no sense at all. So that's an area that I think we wanna do more work around. And the 10th area is around standards. So ensuring women's participation in standards development um, and also ensuring um, in their implementation that standards are gender neutral. Now, having gone through those 10 points, I'm gonna stop with that, but there is more detail behind those points um, in our report that we, in our action plan that we launched, both at the Women's Affairs Minister's meeting in um, Nairobi last September, and we also took that to the Trade Minister's meeting that was held in London. Many of these points were very widely welcomed. In fact, governments and the private sector were saying to us, We've been saying this for some time, but you've now brought this together in a single document with supported by evidence. This is exactly what we need to do. So what I would say to all of you, we have the two things that you need for change. We have the political commitment and we have the recipe and we have the people. You know, we have the private sector, we have the governments, we have the women in business. Let's do it. Let's get on with it. And that's what we need to do. Now, with all of that, let me then turn to, um, to um, our, our, um, our speaker. Um, our first um, speaker, I wanted to give that bit of an overview. And then after we've heard from, um, from Clarice, what I'm going to then do is say something briefly um, about the um, Commonwealth Connectivity Agenda. Um, and then ask uh, Shafkat, who was there with me um, as part of the discussions on that, for his thoughts and observations about that. But let me begin by um, inviting Clarice Irabegiza, who is the founder um, and chief executive officer of DMM, um, 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 he, he in, uh, in Rwanda, um, to uh, make some remarks. She's also one of the E-Trade for Women advocates in the UNCTAD program, which started just a few months ago, I think last year. I believe she's the only um, um, person from a Commonwealth country who's in that UNCTAD program, um, which is another reason, Clarice, why we were delighted that you're able to join us today. Um, and over to you, um, the floor is yours, uh, the virtual floor, I should say, and we're delighted to have you with us. And um, another nod to the Republic of Rwanda today, where we're delighted to hear from you in Kigali, I think where you are. Clarice, over yes. to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Arif. Can you hear me? Very clearly. Great, thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. And uh, thank you so much for the background that you just shared. It was very informative and uh, I'm, I'm happy to share from our experience, uh, both on a personal level and what we've been doing 
uh, you know, in the e-commerce space, in the trade space in Rwanda. Um, just to give you a brief background, I started my business about 10 years ago. And our focus was, you know, how do we digitize the trade ecosystem? Because we could see that that was going to be the direction that we would be taking. We had seen the likes of Amazon, Alibaba, uh, you know, happening. And we knew Africa, this was, you know, in, the, in a short amount of time, this would be the reality. And so we've been focusing on optimizing supply chains and e-commerce in general. And, uh, you know, during this COVID-19 pandemic, you know, e-commerce was one of the ways that the economy remained open uh, during lockdown and, you know, just enabling people to access essential goods like food. And e-commerce is still seen as a, a critical component for economic recovery post COVID-19. So in terms of closing the, the, the gender divide, uh, um, enabling women to participate in the digital economy, there are a couple of things that we're doing and maybe I'll just speak to three um, today. I myself, am a product of Rwanda's, you know, gender sensitive and progressive policies. Uh, you know, enabling me to, you know, start a business as, uh, you know, a junior in college at 22, and I've gotten a lot of support along the way. Um, you know, we have, you know, our Minister of Trade is a woman, our Minister of ICT is a woman, so there are a lot of great things that, you know, are happening for women in Rwanda and continue to happen. And, you know, even in our own business, what we've seen during the, the last couple of years, the number of businesses that we've enabled to get online, 60% of them are women-led businesses. And, you know, you see a lot of women stepping out, trying to, you know, participate in the economy. And there are so many platforms for them to be able to do that here in Rwanda. And, you know, we are happy to see that 60% of the businesses that we support as hey, hey you know, which, you know, we focus on, you know, enabling businesses to access, access digital tools like, you know, payments, get online, have an e-commerce store, you know, how do you run digital fulfillment services, all of that. So 60% is quite significant for us. And, you know, that's, that's one of the things that, that we are really proud of. And we're running a, a Made in Rwanda e-commerce incubation program for the next three years just to support women in, you know, majority, in, in businesses that are majority women. Uh, these are sectors like agriculture, where you find a lot of women are participating in the agriculture value chain or fashion and, and you know, other SMEs. And we, we see this as a great opportunity to continue to enable women to access the skills um, and other opportunities, access to finance, to enable their businesses to continue to thrive. And last but not least, what we're doing right now with UNCTAD, with the E-Trade for Women advocacy role that I play is, you know, upskilling women to participate more in the digital economy. And I'll speak about the masterclass that we're having in about two weeks, starting July 8th. Um, you know, targeting women in the East African region um, will be, you know, working with maybe close to 70, 70 to 100 women will go through a three day masterclass, you know, upskilling them and just equipping them with the skills and the tools that they need to be able to thrive in the digital economy. So a lot of great things happening for women, but we are obviously working towards seeing even much greater results. But again, thank you for having me here today. Therese, can I, thank you very much. Therese, can I just, um, I mean, ask a couple of things briefly on what you said? And we were actually virtually together previously. This is our second virtual <laughs> encounter. Uh, we were together in Geneva virtually at the UNCTAD e-commerce week about uh, six weeks or so ago. And you, rec you will recall, Therese, you were on another panel there and talking about some of these challenges that women entrepreneurs have. And I'd just like to ask you in particular, in the last two or three months, how have you been able to adapt um, your business model, have you been able to adapt your approach and to survive, if not thrive, I don't know, maybe thrive in the, in the, in the challenging context. Now, I know that Rwanda, um, you know, you're not as exposed as I am in the UK. I mean, the UK is, is far more exposed to COVID. Um, I mean, it's one of the worst in the world in that respect in terms of its statistics, although it probably doesn't like talking about it in that way. But in terms of, you know, obviously there is concern of its growth. Um, there's a lot of concern as I speak in South Asia right now, but how have you been able to adapt to that change situation, especially, especially given that it may not have a direct impact on you because you're an IT business, but obviously in relation to your broader, your broader relationships, it must be very disruptive. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it was disruptive. Nobody was prepared for COVID-19. But um, in terms of how we've been able to 
adapt. Yes, we have made changes to our business model. We focused more on uh, building more resilient supply chains. Right now, one of the things that we're doing that we were not doing before is going as far back to the first mile, for example, in the agriculture supply chain, making sure that we're working directly with farmers, trying to get their goods from the farm to the end consumer. Um, so initially we worked with wholesale markets, but now we're going as far back as, as the farmland and even using, you know, technologies such as geospatial technologies to do yield prediction, just so we were able to plan around the supply chains and the logistics needed for that. So that's something really significant that we've done, um, trying to make sure that we have more resilient supply chains because um, the post harvest loss issue that we saw uh, during COVID-19 was extreme. And I mean, we're already dealing with statistics such as 60% post harvest loss. So during COVID-19, that went up to about maybe 80% or more. People were literally throwing away food. So we're trying to see how we can have more resilient supply chains there. And we've, we've, we've repurposed our business to, you know, simply work along that supply chain. But also, secondly, we've been engaging directly with government, with our leadership, trying to make sure that, you know, we are co-creating um, an environment that allows for businesses to thrive. You know, how are we getting businesses online? You know, right now there are, there are a couple of platforms, e-commerce platforms that are currently zero rated, so you can access them online for free. So there are a lot of people who are initially unable to access the internet and now they're able to, you know, still go online and access these essential goods without, you know, necessarily having access to, to the internet. And that's very significant for us. And that came out of all these, the, the kind of advocacy that we've been trying to do with, with, with government. So there are a few things, but I, I'd like to highlight those two as very critical things that we've done in this season. I mean, they're both great examples. And I think the, I mean, you didn't use the word agility, but I think that certainly comes across from what you were saying, being able to yes. be responsive in a, a fast and flexible way, um, absolutely comes across. And I think your point around the platform is, is fascinating. And I mean, Clarice, you really should have a chat with Tana um, Sivasambu, who's one of our chief operating officers based here in London. Um, and she's one of the, with working with Angela, other chief operating officers, driving our work on the Commonwealth's first digital platform for women which has been paid for by women, and it's for women, not to have a chat over chai, but to do business, to do sure. business. Um, and that's I'd something love to. Of, uh, um, it's now operational and we, we have great plans for it. And it's very exciting. And that if you go to our website, cbwn.org, anybody can sign up. It's free at the point of access. Um, and there's a lot of potential there, but we'd love to speak to you about that and get your input and ideas. And, and we, we see that really as providing for the first time this connectivity in a virtual sense for women across the Commonwealth. And thank you very, very much for those um, remarks. I think the Young Town program that you highlighted um, is also, is that program that you referred to, is that being done virtually in July? And because yes, it, it will be virtual. It's an e-masterclass. An e-masterclass, right. Okay, well, that's great. And um, people want to know more about that. Can they only participate from those participating countries or? Uh, yes, it is for women in East Africa. Uh, I'm sure you can sign up, but maybe the timing might not work for everybody. So the, the time zone will be specific for well, East Africa. I mean, absolutely. Thank you very much for mentioning that. Well, what I'll now do is I'll turn, we'll have a, we'll come back to you perhaps in a few moments after we've gone to Shafgat. I'm just going to, Shafgat, before I bring you in, we've got um, quite a bit of time to go. We're just under halfway through, I think, Janet. We, we're due to finish, I think, at 4.30, if I'm mistaken. Yes, I'm mistaken, but we, we are scheduled to start a question period at four o'clock, which is 20 minutes from now. OK, great. Well, we may push that back by about five minutes or so, um, but I will um, try now address the other two things. Um, Shuffcut will be one of the two things before Shuffcut comes in. I want to say something very briefly about the two other initiatives that I mentioned. One of them is the Commonwealth Standards Network. So this is around um, providing um, opportunities for um, particularly standards. Um, in the Commonwealth, and it was very significant that the um, Commonwealth Standards um, um, announcement made, was made by the British Prime Minister um, two years ago. It's all about trying to enhance opportunities for trade in the Commonwealth, um, so to bring down the cost of trade. We know the cost of trade between Commonwealth partners is 19% lower than between non-members. So what this is about is the aim of the Commonwealth Standards Network is to boost trade between the Commonwealth by increasing the use of existing international standards and by providing a platform for collaboration, the network is already allowing countries and members to share their knowledge, trying out new approaches and creating vital links between uh, the economies. So the technical assistance program, it's working with national organizations that um, are their standards agencies. It started in Uganda, Zambia, Papua New Guinea, uh, Vanuatu, and St. Lucia. Um, it's now extending to other countries. 
Um, there are now, I think, some 43 countries, I believe, that have signed up to that initiative. Um, and standards are very important in terms of driving this. So the work of the Commonwealth Standards Network has become even more important in recent months with COVID. Um, and there is work that they're doing, particularly in the area of health, um, to ensure that um, there are guidance documents, there is enhanced training being provided. Um, so the Commonwealth Standards Network really is one of the best kept secrets. There's a lot of work going on there. One of the standards that we at the Commonwealth Business Women's Network have been very vocal about is the standard, the international standard on collaboration. Yes, there is a standard on how you work better together, whether you're a government or a private sector, whether you're a not-for-profit or a for-profit, whether you're a woman-owned business and you're a non not a woman owned business. And that collaboration standard was um, championed by the UK. It's now an international standard. Countries like the UK and Malaysia were instrumental in making it happen. Um, and we work very closely with um, the Institute for Collaborative Working, which drives a lot of that um, engagement on that. And we are certainly working to have that adopted as a best practice model for collaboration in the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth Secretary General herself is personally very um, but much behind this approach and standard, but I think standards are an area that is an all important um, uh, opportunity to enhance trade in the Commonwealth that people probably aren't aware of. But we will be doing more following this event today to make that um, um, much people much more aware of that and how they can benefit from it. The final thing is to, to refer back to the video that I that we started the session with before I bring Shafkat in, and this was the Commonwealth. Um, this was the Commonwealth Connectivity Agenda. So there was a lot of talk at the Commonwealth Trade Ministers meeting about inclusive and sustainable trade, um, realizing that international trade can play a central role in poverty reduction, and that countries have made trade and exports a key part of their development strategy, and countries that have done that have grown at a faster rate. So inclusive trade, um, when we're talking about inclusive trade, we're particularly thinking in the Commonwealth context around, about women, about young people, uh, Clarice, I won't embarrass you by asking you how, how um, old you are or how young you are, but um, you know, um, I think you're certainly um, uh, uh, younger than me. I will give my age away, but, um, but I think young in, in the Commonwealth context, I think it's 16 to, to 29, um, but certainly um, youth and, um, and marginalized groups as well um, is what we mean by that. So when um, the Commonwealth in, 19, in 2018, they met, they adopted this um, connectivity agenda, a big part of that was the importance of not just trade, but inclusive and sustainable development. Um, and there was a particular reference to gender equality in the context of ensuring full and equal participation of women in the economy, as I referred to earlier. So um, gender participation is a key part of that. Um, and you know, there is follow-up work going on in that area. There was a, a meeting that was held, which I'll get, come back to in a moment, um, in relation to um, the Commonwealth Connectivity Week. Um, there was um, um, this uh, recognition that there's a target of $2 trillion for intra-commonwealth trade and expanded investment by 2030. There are four objectives here, global growth, knowledge sharing, employment creation, and development. This is a phased approach. Um, there are um, governments leading in different areas. Um, there are uh, the digital connectivity cluster. Countries involved in that range from Malta to Pakistan to Trinidad and Tobago to the UK to Australia. That's being uh, chaired by the UK. We have the physical connectivity cluster. Countries like Uganda and Botswana and Brunei involved in that, Australia. There's a supply side connectivity cluster. Samoa, St. Kitts, um, Vanuatu, um, Fiji, Gambia, Guyana, others involved in that. There's a regulatory connectivity cluster looking at how to enhance regulatory um, 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 you know, how to address regulatory barriers to trade, countries like Kenya, Malaysia, many others involved in that as well. Um, and these, all in total, there's actually 113 ministries um, involved agencies, um, but also the private sector. And when I say the private sector, I mean chambers of commerce, I mean entrepreneurs, the business community, and yes, the Commonwealth Business Women's Network, which I'll come back to in a moment. So what have they done? What have they done since London in 2018? Well, in digital, they've developed high-level principles on digital connectivity, and I'm very proud to say that we were at the forefront of the Business Women's Network in, in ensuring a, um, that that also addressed online harm as well, so that was one of the areas. On physical connectivity, they developed principles on sustainable investment for digital infrastructure. On regulatory, they also developed um, um, Commonwealth Good Regulatory Practice Principles on the supply side. They've baselined work around smart agriculture and fisheries. They've looked at 
sexual exchange on the coconut sector and on the business to business side there's been wide consultation um, including with organizations like the business business network it's also an academic network as part of this process as well there are best practice tools um, and so there's a lot of work going on in that area and this is really a recognizing the global megatrends and while I was in the room when trade ministers talked about these megatrends about the nature of trade changing multilateralism entering a new phase climate change of course demographics urbanization technology all of what we're talking about today of course health and pandemic now comes into that as well um, and so this is a very important initiative around digital connectivity um, supporting the development of national digital economies physical connectivity which is, is about supporting best practice in digital infrastructure development regulatory connectivity which is around improving regulatory regimes across the commonwealth um, supply side connectivity which is around encouraging the participation of all members in global value chains we talked a bit about earlier um, and underpinning that is inclusive and sustainable trade so um, there is a real impetus behind that. As I say, there are dashboards, there are um, uh, sharing of knowledge and experiences. The UN actually looked to the Commonwealth and its leadership in this area when the meeting took place in February. UNCLUD actually flew and I was in the room there when they said, the Commonwealth, you're leading on this. We need to learn a thing from you in terms of how you're doing it. So I think it, it really is a very important initiative. And there was a survey that was done um, as part of this process, which was shared with us, and Shaka, this is an opportunity now for you to come and fill out by finish making these brief points. The private sector survey on priority issues for Commonwealth trade and investment. I'll just pick up on a few of them. They talked about the um, the impact of digitization, of course, um, the impact um, significant in changing the core technologies used in production and provision of services, about uh, very high, almost 40%. 85% of survey businesses believe that automation and other technologies will impact positively on inter Commonwealth trade in the next five years. That will be even higher now in terms of barriers to the greatest concern about doing business in other Commonwealth countries was actually a lack of knowledge, a lack of market information, and then a difference in legal and regulatory systems. And then in terms of the barriers to e-commerce and digital trade, right at the top of the list is inadequate infrastructure to support e-commerce and digital trade but right behind that that was 40 percent right behind that is 30 just under 30 percent are insufficient skills to effectively use digital services and platforms for e-commerce and digital trade and i should say that also includes janet um you know e-learning as well and that's very much part of the mix as well customs inefficiencies were also talked about licensing procedures and the private sector said um very clearly that we need to look at promoting exports we need to also consider environmental sustainability. We also need to look at um, four focus areas for prioritizing and promoting inter-commonwealth trade, such as customs efficiency, digital infrastructure, transport, lower trade costs, access to digital technologies. These are all the things that came out of that discussion, as well as women's economic empowerment that I've referred to earlier. Now, having gone through that, let me stop. There's more I could say, but let me stop at that. And then invite um, Shafgat um, to join us. Now, I have to acknowledge Shafgat, who at very short notice was able to join us. And, um, and I know it's um, 10 to 9 in Dhaka um, right now, but thank you for joining us. I know that people eat late in the Southeast, so I hope you've already, uh, in South Asia, I hope you've already had your kana this evening. But in any case, um, thank you, Shafgat, for joining us. Shafgat Haida is on the Executive Committee of the South Asian Chamber, the SARC Chamber of Commerce and Industry. He's also Managing Director of um, so Broco Computers, um, very long established um, pioneering um, company in Bangladesh. Shafka, over to you. And I'd like to invite your response in, in two or three areas. One is, what do you think about um, the work the Commonwealth is doing? And you were there with me in terms of the Commonwealth connectivity agenda. What do you think are its strengths or its weaknesses? What do you think could be done better? What, what do you think um, from what you've seen um, you know, is the impact of that? The second thing I'd like you to ask, to um, think about is the impact of digital businesses um, and in, in digital trade as a digital business yourself. And thirdly, um, you know, picking up on what Therese was saying, how, you, how are businesses in South Asia, particularly in the SAR community of South Asia, covering I think eight countries of which five in the Commonwealth, including the Maldives as well, um, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh and the Maldives, how are they responding to COVID at a time when I know things are literally changing by the hour? Um, across South Asia. So Shafkat, over to you and delighted to have you with us uh, today. Uh, thank you very much, Arif. Uh, greetings from Bangladesh. A very good afternoon, good evening, as the case may be to all of you. 
I'd like to thank the Commonwealth and in particular the Commonwealth Business Women's Network and the Commonwealth Telecommunications Organization for having invited me to this event. The people behind the scenes are definitely part of that. It is an honor and a privilege and I'm delighted to be here with all of you. A lot of people use the word post-COVID. I really don't know what it means because we don't know where it's going to end. Reality is we are in COVID times and we will, we will be in it for a very, very long time to come. This is not to be pessimistic, but to be practical and pragmatic. This pandemic has wrecked havoc on the world and we are all being impacted in real time. Coming to trade, the topic of today and trends and patterns, which was the name of the session, where would we be without technology? Where would we be today? This meeting today is proof. The world would be dead without connectivity. Connectivity is a live issue in all economies, small, big, and advanced. Trade is an integral part of economy. Access to communication is a default mechanism for trade. All countries and regions of the world have been concentrating on mechanism, mechanism of how to develop and promote trade. I'm coming up with a new word. You cannot afford to be digitally deprived. We have used this word digital divide for a long, long time. It just meant those who have it, those who do not have it. In today's time, you cannot make anybody to be deprived of the digital connectivity. It is important for trade. It is important for economy. It is important for survival. It should be kind of a baseline of how things go moving forward. You can write volumes on recovery plans, but without digital connectivity, where would you be? I'll touch on a upon a subject which Arif just mentioned. He mentioned the word standards. Now that's something I'm happy to inform you that I happen to be the spokesperson for the quality infrastructure work group. Now, why are we using the word quality infrastructure? It means standards. It means mutual recognition agreements. It means accreditation policies, everything all bunched in one. The reason we came up with this word quality infrastructure, let me step back a little bit, was the fact that most businesses in any country, they're not really connected to the standards and accreditation institutes because that part is supposed to be government and the other part is business, okay? So the whole exercise was built up on the premise that once we have a quality infrastructure group representing the private sector or the business chambers, we could go hand in hand with the government and bring everybody together on the same page. So that was the effort, it's still ongoing, and this is for the SARC region. Uh, just today, by the way, we had a get together of the SAC chambers, and the topic of the day was South Asia regional integration in the midst of COVID-19. So you see, this is an active life subject. Everybody is harping on the same issue. Now, how do we go about it? We might have different policies, but the end result has got to be the same, improving the lives of the people. Of course, our digital dependency has greatly increased suddenly. And this will give a huge fillet to all over digitalization of our societies and economies. This then also makes policy development equally important and urgent, and we can no longer take a wait and watch approach. Uh, not just basic connectivity, but many kinds of basic digital services are becoming almost of the nature of essential services. And some need better regulation and others may even be needed to be provided as public or utility-like services. As far as I know, India and the European Union is undertaking considerable work on public digital infrastructure. And this may be worth emulating in all developing countries. There's something else I'd like to mention here, which is a little digression, not really, but I'd like to point it out here. Though COVID has taken many issues to the back burner, but talking about the future of trade development in the Commonwealth, Brexit remains a very important post issue now. So how do we maximize the post-Brexit gains of Commonwealth countries in the post-COVID should be an interesting area to explore. 
COVID has given a huge boost to the services sector trade, like IT enabled services, e-commerce, and stuff like that. It is an area in which the CTO and UK and the Commonwealth Secretariat should concentrate more studies and infrastructure investments. Also, before the Commonwealth countries talk about bilateral or plurilateral free trade agreement in goods with the UK, it would be interesting this time to start with a free trade agreement in services. Uh, for the time being, I'd like to stop here. Are many other issues I'd like to mention, uh, which uh, refer to digitalization. But if RF, you have a particular question, I'd be happy to answer that. I can't hear you. He's on mute. Your mic is closed, Arif. You on mute. Yeah, thank you very much for that, Shafkat. I'm grateful to you for your comments and remarks there. And I think it is interesting and instructive, encouraging, in fact, to hear that the South Asia Chamber is looking at what it can do in this current moment. Clearly, um, the concentration of, of um, the world's population in South Asia, the density of populations, but also what I have to say, the innovation and creativity right across. I think every country, country in South Asia, um, you know, is actually capable of that innovation. Um, and I think hopefully there'll be a way to come through this. I think, can I ask you just before we open up question, just to, very specifically about what your thoughts are on the connectivity agenda? Because, you know, you were there when we met with other business organizations with the Commonwealth Secretariat and other governments in the work that they were doing. You sat with me in the room for those two or three days, both in August last year and uh, earlier this year. What do you think? Is it... How much potential is there with the Commonwealth Connectivity Agenda? Is it a waste of time? What are your thoughts? My first answer is, it's not a waste of time. The only thing which I would really impress upon is, time is of essence and we need to move, move much faster. Because we can have meetings upon meetings upon meetings, but we need to have timelines of implementation yeah. and then look at the timelines, what we have achieved, what we did not achieve, what was the reason for that. I mean, every study, every timeline, timeline has to have an impact assessment. As long as we can do that, we might fail, we might pass the system, but we have to monitor that. That, I think, is of essence, but the subject matter is absolutely correct, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, that's very helpful to know. Janet, do you, we over to you for questions. Sorry if you were to say to them plan, but we still have about half an hour or so. So any comments or questions that we can take up? Yeah, we have, uh, we, we just really have one question that has come up several times throughout the day. And I actually pulled together a slide for it very quickly. So I'm going to share that. Uh, a number of uh, persons throughout the day have asked about presentation slides and the videos and would the information be posted. So I've been uh, connecting with Tana behind the scenes here and she has let me know that once we have all of the videos tidied up from today's event as well as tomorrow's event, uh, we will be posting them on the Commonwealth Business Women's Network. Uh, and also that there will be an email go out to everyone that uh, shares the, the links to these videos as well as the presentations and the various documents that we've had available over the course of the day that embedded in those QR codes. Uh, so we don't have any uh, specific questions. Uh, yeah, that's okay. So come on, maybe go back to Karee, um, if that's okay, and maybe just ask, um, what do we do in a situation like It's interesting, if you look at South Asia and if you look at Africa, one of the things that's been a highlight of Commonwealth, intra-Commonwealth trade in the last 10 years has been the significant increase in trade between South Asia and Africa. You know, uh, I mean, a lot, a lot of that is between India, but I mean, it's not just India, there are other countries as well. Um, but there is a challenge here, Shafka, and this, this is the very simple challenge. Um, Bangladesh doesn't have a high commission in some of the fastest growing markets in Africa. Right. African countries do not have a high commission in some of the fastest growing markets in South Asia. And I could say the same would be true in other parts of the Commonwealth. So we have a dilemma here. When governments frame their, their work on exports, on trade promotion, etc., they haven't got a clue. They don't know on the ground what are the opportunities in these markets. It may be a Rwanda, it may be a Namibia, it may be in South Asia, it may be a Bangladesh, it may be a Pakistan. 
countries like India, I think, are a bit different because they're you know much better known and their size, of course, will mean that in many cases they they will be direct presence and representation there. But in many cases, and Clarice, you know, if you were to think, you can think of many countries in Africa where the Rwanda, there is no Rwanda High Commission. In Africa, they're probably quite well represented, but outside of Africa, you know, there'll be a number of countries where there isn't one. But this isn't a Rwanda issue. This is a broader issue. You know, there are many countries that don't have that. So in that case, um, we can do one or two things. We can either pack up and go home, put our hands in the air, or we can do what you were suggesting, the three Ps, you know, pragmatic and and um, and be persistent. And I think this is where, Clarice, I look to you. And this is where, Shaftat, I look to you. And I look to us as the private sector. We need to be providing the bridge. We need to be saying to our governments and say, look, um, Honourable Minister or, or whoever it is, you know, you we may not have a direct presence in X country, but we know that there are business opportunities for our businesses in that country and vice versa. And just because that isn't the case, maybe we could organize a visit or a trade delegation or we could do a virtual connection or maybe we could we maybe we could even import some of their films because culture is a great conveyor of how the world lives. Music, of course, is another. So I just want to ask you what we do with that, because that is, you know, we never talk about that. actually. We never talk about the lack of physical presence by governments in Commonwealth countries, but it is a real issue. And I think it's particularly clearly it's an issue for countries like Rwanda um, that don't have, you know, huge numbers of high commissions outside of Africa. And that's not the Rwanda issue. That's also like some other countries. But it's also an issue, I think, for a country like Bangladesh, Shaftat, where, of course, you know, there are a number of high growth markets and Bangladesh just isn't there. So how, how do you respond to that? And what do you think the private sector can do to remedy that situation? Let me ask Clarice first and then go to Shaftat. Clarice. Yeah, thank you so much, Arif. I'll just speak to what we're doing exactly in this specific context. And what we've done right now is in, in partnership with um, relevant government stock stakeholders, we are trying to use a data-driven approach to determining what, what kind of trade is happening between you know, various countries and how can we then uh, you know, plan the next steps as to how maybe if we need to have a physical presence there, how do we need to engage with them further? So that's one thing we've done. And just to be more specific, we're working with our, uh, our Ministry of Agriculture and in terms of um, exports, uh, agriculture exports, trying to see ways that we can specifically, you know, uh, plan for the flights that are going to markets where we see a lot of trade happening um, or even just have much more dedicated uh, presence or logistics to um, enhance trade with those countries. So I will say on our end, we're leveraging technology, trying to see how we can use the data that we have to then, you know, plan the next steps and the policies around that that would make sense for us as a country. Um, there are many things that we could do around it, but I think technology does present a great opportunity, a great platform for getting started. And that's just something practical we've done. Yeah, so that's very good. Shafkat, over to you. Thank you very much, Therese. Yeah, I'll come in on that. The first thing which you described as the physical presence, there's been an issue because in a country like Bangladesh, there are quite a few uh, African countries which are not present, but they are actually present in India. So reaching India, that's the first hurdle. I need a visa to go visit India to the relevant African High Commission or embassy to get a visa. Okay, so that's a typical problem here in our part of the world. The other is some of the uh, African countries have honorary consuls sitting in Bangladesh, which is at least a step forward, but not really enabling us to do everything possible like visas and all that. But at least we can reach them and say, listen, this is what we want to get done. So that's been an issue. And I'd like to come back to something which you're aware of and which has been up and in the works is the formation or the development of an ICSA, Inter-Commonwealth SME Trade Portal. You must have heard this word, which came up before. And this was actually launched as a pilot phase at the Commonwealth Games in the, at the Adelaide by the uh, Honorable uh, Secretary General of the uh, Commonwealth, Patricia Scotland. So this is up there. But as I said earlier on, we're doing things, but we need to speed up. Okay, now this is of essence because just like Clarice mentioned that she has spoken to different agencies, different people. Now, if this trade portal could be up and running or an app could be up and running, this would at least cut across this digital kind of uh, space and make everybody come to the same platform. Now, this is an effort we can all put our heads together to make it more viable. That's what I'd like to say in answer to your question. 
I think, I mean, the example you gave, Shafkat, is a very potent one. I think the Commonwealth SME Association, and there is also a Commonwealth Alliance of Young Entrepreneurs. I mean, both of them are, are good in intent. Um, the challenge, of course, is, and how can I be polite about this? Um, I'm looking at Janet, I'm trying to be polite and not be, uh, and be diplomatic um, and say anything that I shouldn't say, but I just have to say what it is. It, uh, let me just put it, put it to you this way. If, you, if you're talking about a business driven organization and international SME association, the Alliance of Young Entrepreneurs, you've really got to have business people involved. You know, you can't have it top down. You've got to have business people who know what they're talking about. And the reality is the SME association is driven out by, you know, it's run by a program from bureaucrats sitting in Marlborough House in London, the Commonwealth Secretariat, the same with the Alliance of Young Entrepreneurs. So it's good in intent, and that's good. It's good as that it's there. But what we need to see is something that's really driven by business. And we that's the reason. You know, why did women um, put up their own seed capital to set up a digital platform? Why did they do that? Because they felt nothing else was happening. The Commonwealth Secretariat wasn't doing it. The Commonwealth Enterprise Investment Council wasn't doing it. No chambers were doing it. They just said, right, to your point, Shaka, the time, the speed. They said, we're not going to wait any, anymore. We don't want to wait for our daughters, you know, to grow up and then think about doing it. We, we want to do something now. And these were countries, it was amazing. Women came together from a range of different countries, uh, including from Africa, but also from um, South Asia and other countries as well. And I think that's, that's really important to your point. Both of what you're saying, we need to move quickly and find a way to, to bring, I mean, there, in a sense, a lot of these things that you're talking about, both Clarice and Shafkat, they're kind of the, they're the ecosystem. You know, you've got the different parts of the system there. You've got the SME network with SME. You've got other women's organizations. You've got the Commonwealth has various networks. There are 86 accredited organizations, of which are around 20 to 30 people that have some sort of private sector interface. Um, but none of them connect to each other very well. Some of them are, you know, are dead ducks, frankly, they don't really exist more than a piece of paper. Some are very active, um, but th we need to do much better at bringing them together in a way that they can collaborate, they can coordinate, um, and they can really change the dynamic for the lives of citizens in Commonwealth countries, whether it's Kigali or whether it's Karachi, uh, you know, or, or whether it's Kirkness, you know, I mean, wherever it is, the same challenge is there, connectivity. And I think, Clarice, your point around digital connectivity now you know, and also Shafka making the most of this moment is, is huge. Can, I don't want to ask, I mean, Janet, can I just ask any more questions or comments from the audience? Or yes, do you want to yes I actually have one for both of our panelists. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to ask the one for Clarissa first. Uh, earlier when you were speaking, you mentioned about training for women. And this is really a two-part question. So the first part is that training specifically to do with trading internationally. And the second part, I know in my own country, in Canada, that there's tremendous support for women entrepreneurs and particularly those who aspire to take our businesses to an international market. Uh, so the second part of the question is, what steps have you taken to, in your country, if any, to provide women access to international markets? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Janet, for your questions. And yes, um, the training programs that we have are primarily to help women build more competitive businesses, not just so they can trade locally, but also globally. So when you talk about digital trade and specifically around e-commerce, it's really around global competitiveness. We are not oblivious to the fact that a lot of goods are being traded um, online. And for these businesses, what digital trade does for them is it opens up borders. It opens up the world to their businesses. So that is the primary message that we are communicating. And with the UNCTAD um, e-trade uh, you know, e program, that's targeting women in East Africa to trade within the East African region, but also globally. And with the Made in Rwanda incubation program that I mentioned, um, this is targeting local industries to enable them to be able to be globally competitive. So yes, and in terms of targeting women, we're focusing on um, sectors that employ women in terms of a majority. And like I mentioned, it's agriculture, it's the fashion industry and other types of SMEs. And, you know, our goal is to really see that we build globally competitive businesses. Can I ask you a question, Clarice, from my study? Sure. Sure, okay. Shaka. Uh, you mentioned that 60% of the women are doing online business, which is the majority. Okay. Uh, uh, what is the reason for yeah. women? 60% of the women are in online businesses. I'm curious exactly what would be the reason? 
For um, women, so, they learn online than men. So for us, I think uh, one of the things that we've seen driving women to get online is the fact that an online business allows for them to be able to do a little bit more, run a business and take care of their families. It opens up a platform for them not to exit um, the formal, you know, their formal career, whatever it might be, uh, because of, you know, having to stay at home and raise their children. So we have a lot of shops that we're seeing, you know, it's somebody's, you know, you know it's in their backyard, they're making some kind of children's toys or, you know, they have a farm somewhere and, you know, they want to keep, you know, rearing chickens or growing whatever it is that they're growing uh, on their farm, but also be able to sell that online. So I think primarily it's because it allows for them to have, you know, a well-rounded life, I would say. Um, but also we've made the barrier to entry quite low for women. And, you know, we're encouraging women to get online. Um, you know, hey, hey, is, uh, I, I'm a woman and we have 53% female majority. So maybe there's a bias towards women and how we connect with each other. Uh, but I, would, I, I mean, if I were to, 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 to share a few thoughts on that, that's, that's what I think it is. That's wonderful to hear. I knew the answer, but I wanted it to come from you. Women oh, okay. can do multitasking. <laughs> I mean, Sounds great... like that was a setup, Clarissa. It was a setup. <laughs> Thank you, Shafkat. You're welcome. Now I Pleasure have a question you for online. you, Shafkat. Yes. Uh, Can you tell the difference between online and virtual? Any of you? Oh, I know, I know. Tell but me. that's a whole other workshop. We have digital training, <laughs> online training, virtual training, e-learning. What is the difference between online and virtual, ma'am? I, I can't, it's not my role to hijack this presentation. <laughs> I have a question to ask you and I would be okay, happy to do, have that do. discussion with you or anyone, but just not in this, at this oh, okay, particular great. moment. I, I want to be respectful of your no agenda. Uh, so my question to you, sir, uh, earlier you talked about taking actions. What would you consider as actions that need to happen in order to take things to the next level? Okay, when I say need to happen, we get down to sit in meetings, have conversations like this, and we're very happy putting them out all on pen and paper, okay? This should happen, this must happen, should have happened, and stuff like that, with due respect. But generally, when we make recommendations, generally we do not put timelines on those. If you've seen most of the papers, there are many recommendations, many suggestions, but none of them has got a timeline attached to it. So I guess if it's some kind of a benchmark to test ourselves against or to make a check on our activities, I think that would be very, very beneficial. That would be very, very beneficial. Because when you give a project manager a job to do, what is it, what do you do? He has a Gantt chart, a timeline-based project and stuff like that. But generally, when we make recommendations, suggestions, this is not the case. It's only when a project starts that you start all this timeline business. That's the differentiation I have. The timelines, setting timelines and attaching timelines, specific Absolutely. goals with Absolutely. these. And I would bet, because you know, when, you when you're setting SMART goals, one of the things that you're supposed to make sure is that it's achievable and it's realistic and it's time bound. Absolutely. And then there's Absolutely. a name attached to it, whether that's a particular person or an organization that's going to take True. the lead on behalf of everyone else and, and make sure they get that project across the finish line. Agreed. Uh, so uh, a couple of people have asked about the uh, platform and uh, I'm not sure if Arif, if you are the best person to speak to that or maybe yeah, Tana, just, um, even. Yeah, uh, let me just um, briefly say something about that. So the platform, um, in fact, there's a press release which is coming out today. In fact, it's just been um, issued in the last few minutes and I'm going to be formally saying something more about that in the closing um, remarks with Nisa. Um, so I, I, you know, in a moment, um, so I kind of, I'll wait until that moment in about 10 minutes before I make the, the, the exciting announcement. But what I will say to you is that the platform that we have, it's the most advanced in use by any Commonwealth organization. It's the first time that women have been actively involved in putting it together. They haven't created it, but they, you know, there's a company in London that's from um, a startup accelerator from a University of London that they're using. But I'll say more about that in a few moments. Um, for us, it was very important to ensure that it, it was really about doing three things. It's allowing women to connect to each other. So there's a strong community dimension to it. There's around um, um, uh, collaborating. So, you know, the tools to enable them to collaborate 
and learn, I think, is key. So a learning environment was also very important, particularly learning to acquire knowledge, to grow their businesses, to internationalize their businesses, to uh, have capacity buildings, to grow um, their businesses, um, and also in terms of their skills and leadership. Um, and the third area is, is trade, you know, to do business, to do business with each other. One of the things that we've been working on is the area of contracting, open contracting, to encourage consortia of women, so a woman from Bangladesh, a woman from Rwanda, a woman from the UK, a woman from Jamaica could come together, they could put together a bid for a tender, working on different skill sets, different time zones, and that consortia-based approach is possible through a platform. So the platform is around the three Cs. We call it the three Cs platform. It's around connectivity, it's around the other C is capacity building, and the third C is commerce. Now, it doesn't currently exist as far as we know in the world today, I mean, the closest you could find is the UN has two or three initiatives, but they don't address all three. Certainly not um, leveraging the Commonwealth advantage that was talked a bit about earlier, where you have a 20% reduced business. You know, Rwanda and Bangladesh, it will cost them 20% less to do business than Rwanda and Ethiopia or Bangladesh and, um, and, uh, um, and Bhutan, whatever. You know, so I think there's a Commonwealth advantage here that we need to make the most of. Um, and we also think it's very important because this platform that we're using um, is also, it's using analytics, it's geared up for artificial intelligence, it is very flexible, it's adaptable. Um, and I said the announcement I'm going to be making in a few moments in the closing remarks will be a very good, I'll be providing very solid evidence in the form of the statement that I'm going to be giving as to why that's the case. Not because I'm saying it, but because um, another key organization globally is saying it. I won't say more than that. If I can just piggyback on what you said, you're talking about the platform. It's a really interesting idea to me because as a Commonwealth businesswoman, hmm. I have haphazardly found my way to other countries in the Commonwealth and struck up partnerships and teaming agreements with other women, female founders uh, in Jamaica, Trinidad, Guyana, and Mexico. And uh, as a result, we've grown our businesses together, but we've had to do that and figure that out sort of for ourselves by meeting up randomly at an event and then deciding we like each other and we're going to do business together and then continuing to work together. So it's really interesting that there's going to be a forum to help make some of those connections happen. Yeah. And, and this has been, you know, 20 odd years in the making. A little bit louder, we're having a hard time hearing 20, you. 20 odd years in the making. I mean, this has been talked about for years. Um, I mean, if I had a if I had a penny for every Commonwealth meeting I've been to where this has been taught about, I'd be a very rich person, especially in this economic recession we're going into now. But we're doing it, and I mean, what was interesting is that women from different Commonwealth countries. And by the way, let me be very open with you: these are not rich women. You know, these are these are middle income women or low income women, but they have pooled their resources um, well with one or two. You know, um, you know, I mean. Know, the guy involved as well, but pretty much it's, it's pretty driven, and that's really important. And I think exactly, Janet, the point that you've made. We, we don't want. Why should it be haphazard? You know, you, Janet, you've not got the time to waste on doing it haphazard. You just want to move quickly and make, make have, have success. So does Clarice, and so does Shafkat. And I think the way the world is changing now, there's no reason why not. So that's really why we've done it. We also have, and I think it's worth just reminding people about this. Commonwealth, we have incredibly valuable plug and play. You know, we have these 80 old, you know, if you want a Commonwealth network for parliamentarians, for journalists, for the private sector, for medical doctors, for nurses, for sport, for, um, I mean, you name it, um, for beekeepers, there are, there's a Commonwealth network for you. So we have a number of those accountants as well as another SMEs, Shafkat, you were mentioning. Um, uh, but in any case, we, what we want to do is we want to connect them together. We want to break the silos. In fact, we don't want to break them, we want to smash them. We want to smash the silos and we want to facilitate these linkages through the platform which we've got. Now, how are we going to make money from it? How are we going to monetize it? What's the business model? Well, that's what we're working out now. We've got some ideas and plans around that, but we have a, a core principle, which is very important to us, that we've had a long debate about, but we, we've decided that's what we want to do. And it's a little bit like something that's very precious in the UK called the National Health Service, which has a basic principle, which is free at the point of access. And that's no different to the Commonwealth Business Women platform. It's free at the point of access. No matter who you are, no matter where you are, you access it for free, you join the community for free, and then you can do a number of things, a number of additional things you may need to pay something for, but not a lot. Um, and that's kind of the way we're doing it. So we're all, at the moment, volunteers in the Business Women's Network. We put in some seed funding, but we're now trying to ensure we have a sustainable 
um, footing to drive this thing forward. And that's really, really important. Janet, how are we doing on time? Are we, um... uh, we, we have about nine minutes left, but we do have one more question that has come up. And so if I may, I'd like to ask that. It actually, it's an interesting question to me because as I said, I have uh, created partnerships and teaming agreements with a number of other female founders around the world. Mm -hmm. And my colleague in Guyana has brought this same issue to my attention at times when we've been working on projects together. It's specifically around receiving payment for work that we do. And she has mentioned to me living in Guyana that there are some limitations that she faces around things like PayPal and, and, and how they are able to interact with that. The question that's come in is how digital payments are playing a role for women, um, women's roles in trade in Rwanda and other Southeast or South Asia countries. So I'm, I'm guessing from that question, uh, perhaps other countries, uh, women in other countries run into these kinds of issues around being able to accept electronic payments or make electronic payments. And I know even just for me, when I'm trying to do an electronic funds transfer to certain countries to pay for services being happening in those countries, it can be a bit of a challenge. And, and no, we have the same a pretty problem sophisticated in banking system, so I'm sure others run into difficulties. PayPal is an issue in Bangladesh as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this was an issue, Shafkat. You remember when we were there with the senior trade officials back in February this year, just five, six months ago, there was a whole item of discussion that became very animated. And people said about people, we taught, we actually taught about our platform. And I won't say who the person was, but there was a, um, a person who worked for a, um, an Asian aid NGO. And she said, well, you know, you, all these platforms, why are you doing this? You should just be using PayPal. You should be using X, Y, or Z. And then we made the point, in fact, other people, someone from the Commonwealth Secretariat got up and said, well, actually, the problem with those platforms is they're so damn expensive. <laughs> they're not very user-friendly in that respect. And there, there are challenges there. So I think there is a point here around what, what is happening with digital currencies in the Commonwealth. And what does that mean for breaking barriers down, facilitating payments more easily, and enabling things to be better? I think this is an area that I don't know that CTO, again, I won't see the marks from what they're going to be announcing in a few moments, but that is also another area that's also very topical. Clarice, did you want to say something about the, the payments? How have you dealt with that issue, particularly when you've been trying to work? I know there's a lot of momentum in Africa with the African free trade area in terms of connectivity, but particularly when you're working countries outside um, where the payment challenges may be more limited and where you haven't got direct access. How, how have you dealt with that? Um, oh, yeah, I mean, I could resonate with everyone. We've had huge challenges around digital payments. And uh, we're, there are a couple of interventions through the, um, you know, EWTP uh, a platform that is uh, being developed uh, with the World Trade Organization. But there are quite a couple of challenges, even in terms of broader financial inclusion. Uh, but we, it's one of the, th the things that we try to enable our businesses that we are getting online to uh, have access to. So we do offer some digital payment solutions, but not very comprehensive. Uh, but at least it gets them started. It allows for women to be able to accept digital payments, you know, for their you know, farm produce and things like that. But there are quite a couple of challenges in terms of uh, the broader, you know, global trade as well as financial inclusion. I mean, anybody from Kenya who's on the call, and I'm, I'm just on the, on the, on the audience, I see we have um, there, you'll know very well about Safaricom's um, Easy Passer, um, which is pioneering. And in fact, we have tomorrow, we have um, um, Sandra Jambu, who's um, um, in a senior role at Safaricom. She's actually the new chief executive of UN Global Compact. She's in our, we have a series of conversations tomorrow. And by the way, if you go to the CBWN website, you'll see um, cbwn.org, you'll see we have a series of conversations tomorrow with women leaders in the Commonwealth, starting in the morning, finishing uh, later in the afternoon. We start them specifically, end in the Caribbean, 30 minute segments, short conversations with women in the journey that they've made. And very much like Clarice is saying, what's the journey that you've had? These are women from different backgrounds, right through their life journey and talking about the challenges and how they've dealt with them, uh, particularly in business. And I think the issue around payments is a very real one. And I think this is an area where I think we need more work to be done. But we also, in the process, Janet, and I'm looking to you and I'm looking to Clarice, we need Janet, we need you, we need Clarice, we need all the women to be part of that conversation, to be telling us what are your experiences, what are your challenges, what are your solutions. And also, Shafiq, I'm looking to you as well, because in South Asia, although you've not directly referenced it, um, I think you should say something briefly, perhaps, about the South Asia 
chamber, the Women's um, Council. So the, the South the South Asia Chamber has a has a very well established, and we I have had previous experience of working with them, the South Women's uh, um, Council, I think it's called, which brings together the business communities across the South Asian countries. Do you want to just say something very briefly about that? Because people may not even be aware that there is a, a business community that brings together business women across a quarter of the world's population. Okay. Are you talking about the uh, Women's Swek. Council? Swek. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Uh, the the uh, SAC Chamber has a very uh, active uh, Women's Entrepreneurship Council. And uh, obviously, as we saw, each of the countries has uh, quite a few representatives on that board. And they're in place for two years. But that doesn't mean they're reps. That basically means they're supposed to back end the whole process into their countries, respective countries. And coming back to what I mentioned earlier as a uh, Commonwealth Trade Portal, the same exercise is now being carried out for the SAR Trade Portal. So when this thing came up about the Commonwealth, I informed them about that. And we said, rather than repeating the exercise, why don't you bring everybody's thought processes, efforts together and make it one central exercise? So what I'm trying to say is this is something which is being talked about. Proposals have been made. I actually made a proposal to Commonwealth on behalf of the uh, sector, uh, the SMEs. And the same thing happened with uh, SAR. And even today, when I was talk, talk, talking to one of the former Secretary Generals of SAR, and I mentioned that I'd be on this program, and I invited him as well, he said, why did you talk about the SAR trade portal? So I said, that we can talk in tandem with what's going to happen in future. So everything is like, as I said. Now we just need, make the, we need to converge somewhere, and very quickly. And I just want to make a point here, if you'll allow me, that if we really want to benefit from the digital economy, it re really requires affordable tele telecommunication services, okay? Now, this is a pretty big diverse area because some developed countries have lower charges than lower developing economies having higher charges for access to internet. Now, this dichotomy is actually uh, not being able to, enabling you to join on a level playing field. That's another challenge. The charges, the taxes are higher in the least developed countries on, uh, on access to the internet services. Now, as a Commonwealth, whether we could emphasize this fact to the Commonwealth countries, whether we could talk and make things a little more, uh, what should I say, acceptable, palatable to the existing economies in the region. We are 54 countries now. Around 50% are okay. Around 50% are not okay. Well, I'm conscious of the time. We have one minute left to wrap up this session, and then we have some closing remarks by Rip as well as Nisa. So um, would you be able to perhaps, we don't have any more questions in the queue. So would you like to wrap this session up, Rip, and we'll move to our close? Yeah, thank you very much. So let me just um, do that if in the few seconds we've got remaining by thanking um, Clarice, um, Clarice Oropagiza there. I think you win the prize, Clarice, for The Prettiest Garden. Um, I love that tree in the background. There. Thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna, when I go to Kigali, I'm going to, you know, you've got to invite me for a cup of tea or something. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. You're welcome. Um, it's, very, um, it's very hot here in London, but I think that is, um, and, uh, you know, the best option. Um, Shafka, you and I are a bit more traditional. We've got a sort of books or, or whatever in the background. Right. I've been um, wearing a jacket for after a long, long time. I know, yeah. Well, I, I can, I'm wearing a shirt and a tie, but I'm not going to tell you that I'm wearing shorts underneath because, of course, yeah. <laughs> No, um, and uh, but that's the truth. So there you go. Um, I, 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 I should probably shouldn't have said that. Um, Shafia, thank you so much for joining us as well. I know that um, it's later in Dhaka, but I appreciate your um, your you know joining us and adding a rich perspective. Clarice as well. Um, both of you. It's been a, a smaller conversation with the three of us, but I think a very rich one. Raised a number of key points around um, uh, digital payments, around Commonwealth initiatives um, in the era of trade that needs to be better known, supported, and understood and also the central importance of women in business, which has been the theme running throughout today. So with that, we'll close this session. Now we're carrying on directly with the closing session, but I'll let Janet provide the, uh, the link to that. Thank you, Janet. Sorry, I was on mute. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so last reminder, if you would like to download the document that was referenced during this session, 
pull out your cell phone, open up your camera, and you can scan this QR code, and then you can uh, just tap on the little box that appears, and you'll be able to save and uh, download and save that for yourself. Uh, I did mention a little while ago that the uh, there have been questions about what's going to happen with the documents. We're, we're working behind the scenes diligently to make sure that we make everything available. Uh, all of the videos from today, you know, it's been recorded in one massive file, if you can appreciate that. Uh, so that it needs to be separated into the individual sessions and then uh, tidied up. So those will be available as well as the sessions, uh, the videos from tomorrow's session, which has, hasn't happened yet, of course. I hope you will join us again tomorrow. Uh, you can certainly uh, go to the Commonwealth Business Women's Network website and find the registration information if you don't already have it. Uh, again, always asking you and uh, inviting you to connect with everyone on social media so that we can continue the conversation, although I know that Arif and Misa are going to talk about continuing that conversation on the CBWN network uh, website and, and whatnot. Uh, so we've got the Twitter hashtags, uh, we've got the Twitter handles, we've got LinkedIn. There's really no reason for us not to be able to stay connected now that we have come together. And uh, I am going to ha hand it over in a moment, but I would say that we have as many people have expressed in the chat, we have learned so much today. I'm feeling a little bit overwhelmed, to be honest, but we've learned so much. And really, unless we go away and apply those learnings, nothing happens. That's the only thing that changes the world. When we take what we've learned and we do something with it. So my last words for the day would be to make sure you go out there and use the information from today to change the world and make it a better place because that's what we're all trying to do together. Mm -hmm.